imagine that that's me when I was 18 years old and that's a story for another day uh, but speaking of stories I have a really good one for you today and it's one of the kind of coolest moments I probably had in my life there's plenty of them like I had quite a few cool moments uh, but this one is actually coming from my spiritual background when I was still a devoted you could say student of spirituality, questioning the question of who am I, trying to realize the big truth of life, meditating, and and that led me to India, where part of my time I spent in a, oh my God, my nose itches. And now I realize I won't cut that out because this is a one take video. Well, it is what it is. So that journey took me to India, where uh, part of the time I spent, well, I went to, see Dalai Lama in uh, Dharamsala, listen to him talk. Uh, but before that, I went to a famous city called Rishikesh, which is uh, told to be the unofficial uh, world capital of yoga. And it's kind of a weird city because there's, I think, it, I, I'd say it became very commercial. Like there's, uh, because there's so many tourists, there's so much stuff, which is like, you just feel like you're, I don't know, in some hippie yoga poster or something and there's a lot of people trying to sell you yoga related stuff but so there were cool things and there were like not so cool things but that being said though um the there were a lot of ashrams there and my teacher of the day he invited me to go to a monastery which is called an ashram in india and to meet some of his friends who were monks there and interestingly enough although it's an indian uh, ashrams, monastery, uh, and it was full of Indian monks, uh, there were a couple of monks who were Canadian, actually a, a father and daughter, and they were both quite aged, but actually really incredible people. Um, I remember the father's name, his, uh, his sacred name, it's Swami Atmas Rupananda. Uh, you can ask me later how I learned to say that <laughs> without stumbling. But uh, I was living in the ashram for about a week and every day I would go to meet them because they, the Swami at Masrupananda and his daughter, they had their own private uh, quarter and I went there doing uh, like an open time, uh, I think it was like between like two and three, where you and anyone can come in and to talk to them, have some tea or whatever. And I was like a really hungry student. I always really liked learning and figuring things out. And I was definitely on a quest and on a journey then. And so I was sitting there with them through that hour and I just had so many questions and I was so interested to learn from their wisdom. And I really liked them too. They were like both very humble and, and knowledgeable. And also it, what's interesting is that Swami Atma Rupananda, from what I know of, he used to be a very successful businessman back in Canada. Uh, but then, uh, from what I remember of the story, he realized that he's not happy. He had like, you know, a big, huge house by the beach or something like that and lots of money and everything, but he realized he's not happy. And I think that's when he met his teacher, a famous monk known as uh, Swami Chidananda, who was a direct student of Swami Shivananda, the famous saint of Rishikesh. Long story short. Uh, Atmos, the, the soon-to-be Atmas Rupananda met Chidananda, uh, also a really cool spiritual teacher. I liked his teachings when I used to read them. But uh, so he uh, he got I think he got so impressed that eventually he dropped everything, dropped his business, moved to India, and became a monk. And then later on, some years later, his daughter followed, and they both became monks. So interesting story. But uh, when I was spending time with them and talking to them, the funny part is that for after that hour finished there was so much we had to, to talk about like i was so interested to hear I, I did like question myself like is that okay i'm like looking at the clock i'm like the time is finished but i could see that uh, swami at Mastrananda was just so engaged in the conversation that uh, he he there wouldn't be a sense that i need to go and i think i even like asked like should i maybe go it's time he's like no no fine fine just stay stay and we just kept talking for hours i think it was like you know it started at two and at five, uh, Swami Atma Srupananda, he used to go by the um, Gang uh, Ganga, the famous sacred river, which uh, is in the middle of Rishikesh. And there was like a pathway where he would walk back and forth uh, to do his exercise. 
like uh, to make sure he's moving. And uh, when the time came to do that, he's like, you know what, let's, let's go together. Let, let's walk, you know, walk with me. Let's, let's take that walk together. And, and then we would walk back and forth together and talk and talk. And eventually, like, after that ended around 6 p.m., then, then I'd be like, okay, well, this was great, but, you know, there's limits to everything. We need to, like, you know, I need to be uh, respectful of their space. And eventually I... Uh, you know that that was the end of the conversation but then the next day we did that again i think we did it like for like three days in a row uh now as i continue let me check if the video is doing well and the video is doing well and let me check the audio and the audio is doing well so we can continue it's the life of a youtuber because if you don't press a button to record audio or video you end up talking forever and then you realize you just wasted it all because nothing recorded and coffee gives you more energy to have a good talk. So, let's continue. Uh, now, but interestingly enough, that's not the part of the story that, that is a part of the story that I want to tell you, but that's not sp the specific moment which uh, this episode is about. Uh, the episode which I'm specifically, I want to point you to is when we were having those conversations with Swami Atmos uh, and uh, with his daughter, um, he they, they mentioned that there's this well-known spiritual teacher, uh, Swami Muktananda, who's, I think he was Canadian as well, and he apparently became like enlightened when he was in India, in the same ashram, and he... Uh, he then moved back to Canada and got a whole falling of people. And once in a year, or, or twice, but anyway, he would come with a bunch of his students to the ashram. And uh, he would kind of live with them and, and give uh, special teachings and show them around. And, and I heard like stories that he's kind of an interesting personality. Well, first of all, he, uh, I, I hope I'm going to find a video on Google if I do, if I did, you're seeing it now through the magic of editing. And uh, so he's an impressive guy in terms of physique because he's a black gentleman uh, who's big and tall and just, just huge. Uh, he actually looked a little bit like uh, Swami Shivananda, I guess, because I heard stories and you can see that Swami Shivananda is also big and dark skin, so maybe that made an impression on people as well. But it's just kind of, it's, you know, it's like, I don't want to focus too much on the looks, but definitely that, that made an impression. You see him and you're like, oh, that's a big dude. And then he's wearing the, the special monk's outfit. So that there was that impression of, oh, this is something cool. And uh, I was suggested that I should just go talk to him, or, or actually not necessarily talk to him, but uh, to go to his teachings, like evening teachings, where they sing as well, but long story. And uh, I decided, I, I felt intrigued. I was like, oh, that, that sounds interesting. You know, that sounds, I'd like to meet him. And I went to the evening teachings, like I think it was like from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And I was sitting there with another Westerner uh, from the ashram who was visiting the ashram as, as well. And we got to know each other. And when the teachings ended, uh, I think the, the, the guy who I was spending time with, who I was sitting next to, he was like, you know what, go, go and ask. I think I, I maybe had a question about whatever he said, Swami Muktananda. And uh, the person I was hanging out with told me like, no, just go ahead, go to Muktananda and just ask your question. And I'm like, really, is that okay? Like, I'm, I'm not gonna bother him. He's like, yeah, just do it. And I decided, you know what, heck, heck what? I'm, I'm gonna go and do it. And I walked in and whenever I had a chance to speak, because obviously he was surrounded by a bunch of people, I asked him that question. I don't remember what that question is or was. But obviously he liked the question and he looked at me, he's like, walk with me. He said that specifically and <laughs> he'll, I say that very specifically because that phrase you'll see was repeated a few times. But then that night he's like, walk with me. And I'm like, okay. And then we started walking through the hallway, like leaving the room and we talked and we continued talking and talking pretty much all about enlightenment and what enlightenment is and what it does it mean to become enlightened. And that was a big subject uh, to me at the day. And uh, we went eventually outside, took a walk around the area of the ashram. Uh, funny part is that the, the dorms where I was living at the ashram, they give you a room. Uh, I knew that it's closing and locking down at 10 p.m. But our talk had kept going and I didn't want to break the flow. 
And so I'm looking at the clock, I'm like, oh, this is past 10, I'm in trouble. But then we continued talking about and until it turned 30, we kept on, it was kind of cool because, you know, kind of those moody moments because it was dark and I think it was like full moon or, or, or bright enough moon. You know, There's no like artificial light, just the light of the moonlight. And we just talked and talked about enlightenment. But there was a moment there where I recognized that he considers himself enlightened, or I think I think that was the case. Uh, but the thing is, uh, I made a video already about that. Like uh, it's called "Enlightenment is not what you think," or I break this down in detail. So feel free to watch that video if my thought is going to sound too controversial for you. But uh, the message of it was and is that uh, anyone can have that mind expansive uh, state that experience of the expansive state of your consciousness or you recognize that you're not the body and I worked my ass off to experience that and to get that realization which some people call enlightenment and I, I break down like why I think this it's not as big as people say or think in that video so if you're interested in that subject just go watch that video there's a link here somewhere in the corner but uh, but not to go stray uh, at that day I I was humble about it but but I, I realized and I, I believed with certainty that I, I went through that experience and I know what enlightenment is. And so, but his idea, one of the thoughts he said is that you, it's a young person cannot become enlightened. Like that, like you have to have at least a certain age, which is kind of weird now that I look back because I think he was like in his mid thirties. He looked youngish, but maybe like 35, I don't know, most 40 years. So. So, but that was kind of an, inter an interesting idea, and I, I, I got confused because he's an authority, and I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm like, but I'm like, I read, you know, when I had that experience of expansive consciousness, afterwards I started understanding all the scriptures that I was reading, and and it just it was clear that I'm like, I know what this is about, but then he told me like, you know, you can't, I, I didn't tell him like I'm enlightened man, <laughs> but I just, I just was conflicted about what he said because he pointed out that, you know, I can't, I was like 20 then. And he pointed out that you can't be enlightened if you're 20. And I'm like, well, that's kind of weird. So does that mean I don't know what I've been talking about? Does that mean I, I my, my experience is fake? And, and kind of that was almost the end of the conversation and that kept me thinking. Now, a funny story is I come back to the dorms, it's closed, it's locked. I can't get in anymore. I think the guard just shooed me away. So I went uh, next to the house of Swami Atma Surpananda, who I was spending my days with, and uh, I just found a bench there and I just decided I'm gonna sleep here. And I spent some time, it got cold, it got really cold, it was like autumn, autumn, but at night it got cold. And so I went to a public bathroom, and it was kind of a big one, so like the section of the toilet was further down. Uh, and I just lay down there and tried to get some sleep until four, uh, P, uh, 4 a.m. because that's when Swami Atmosrupananda gave his morning teachings. I'm sorry I keep scratching, I'm just so itchy. Can't do anything about it, this is a one take video. I'll do my best not to scratch. Anyway, so he gave a teaching at 4 a.m. and uh, as soon as that hit, I went to the teaching, I meditated, and kind of my day started. But it's, it's a funny moment because uh, that's something I do sometimes say if I go to visit someone as a guest and they're like, oh, I hope this bed is not too small or, or this room is clean enough. And I, I like to make that joke and say, well, you know what? I once slept in a public bathroom in India. So it's never probably gonna get worse than that. <laughs> so that's actually when it happened, how it happened. But then uh, the, the, the first night that I spent my time with Muktananda, he invited me the next day to go with his students I think that's what happened to a sacred ashram somewhere in another city nearby. And, and I thought, okay, that's cool, you know, I should do that. And I didn't think much of it, but I went there and I hung, I hung out with his students a bit. And then I um, was walking around that ashram and obviously all of his students, that's kind of how spirituality and that whole culture works. Obviously his students were just always following him and, and, and asking him questions, you know, they were just like, they were in love with him. And I could see that he wasn't always enthusiastic about that. There, I could see that, that from his body language. Uh, but I didn't want to bug him myself because, you know, like, his students want his attention and that's fine with me. But, uh, so I was look, not looking for him. 
But then I went to the square of the ashram and he was sitting there on the bench, a couple of his students sitting next to, next to him, and he saw me. And he looked at me, he's like, you know, come here, Sorry. sit with me. <laughs> you know, he had this kind of deep voice, like, sit with me, Rokas. And I'm like, sure, man, okay. Like, <laughs> and I sat down and we talked again, like for 30 minutes or 45. And, but then I, I thought about his idea of a young person cannot get enlightened. And I kept digesting, is he right or, or is he right? And I'm wrong or, or the other way around. And then I, as I was contemplating that, I remembered that, you know, back in the day, I read so much about spirituality. I was, I was just completely uh, lost in it. And uh, I, one of the, the greatest saints of the previous century is considered to be, oh, the name just, just left my head, but I'll, I remember it though, Ramana Maharshi. Ramana Maharshi was considered to be the, the, the saint of the previous century, the, the greatest saint. Beforehand, it was, I'm gonna forget that one. He's a cool dude, I really liked him. He worshiped Kali, the goddess of destruction, I believe. Huh. And it's been a long time since I spoke about that stuff. Anyway, Ramana Maharshi. So Ramana Maharshi, the, his biography story is that he got enlightened when he was 14, I believe. And just by accident, he was holding his breath. He was interested in, in scriptures, sacred scriptures, but he was holding his breath because he was afraid to die from suffocating. And he decided to challenge himself and he decided to hold his breath until the very last moment he couldn't. And then the brain switched, his mind expanded and he, he got enlightened. And later he became recognized as the enlightened guy. And there's a whole story about him. I won't go to detail there too much, but he's like really recognized, like big time. And uh, he got enlightened when he was 14. And uh, as we were discussing with Muktananda, I told him like, what about, Maha what about Ramana Maharshi? And like, you're saying that you cannot get enlightened if you're young. But then Ramana Maharshi, he got enlightened when he was 14. And he's like, oh, well, Ramana Maharshi is a special case. You know, he's like, and I'm not like trying to make fun of him. He's like just kind of how he talked, and, and I actually like that. But he's like, you know, and he, she's like a one in a million, you know, case. He's a very special case. I'm like, well, that means you can become enlightened when you're young, right? And he's like, well, I guess, but you have to be like super special. I'm like, okay, well, that's a downer for me, I guess, because then that that's like I'm not super special, I guess. But then still, I was like, but shit, that that kind of doesn't make sense. But then that's, that was the end of the conversation. Then we went to the bus again, came back, and I didn't see him that day. And I thought, uh, I kept thinking about that because I was confused. I was like, damn, I really invest in this. I really think I know what I'm talking about. But this guy says I can't because I'm too young. And so what's right, what's wrong? And then I took a book, which I actually spoke about in one of my recent One Take videos. Actually, the very first one, I mentioned uh, Bhagavad Gita a famous uh, short segment of a sacred book, which I kind of liked, it made a big impression on me. It's about Arjuna, a prince, talking to Krishna as they were heading to war and he had to fight members of his family and he didn't want to. And then Krishna revealed himself to be a god and, and they had a conversation, like a, kind of an interesting deep one, philosophical. And uh, by the end of that ride and that book, Arjuna, the prince, he realizes Krishna is right, and he decides to sh shed away all his doubts. And there's a moment where he says, I can't quote exactly right now, I can't remember all the words, but basically he says, it's like, now I see the truth and I have no more doubts. Like, you know, my doubts are, are gone or whatever. And that, I read that quote because I was like looking for answers and I read the book, I, I kept carrying it with me all the everywhere and I kept reading, reading it. And I read again, and, and I read that segment, that really that last segment, and I read that quote, you know, I, I, do, I don't have any more doubts. And it just resonated with me. And I was like, shit. You know, it's like, I shouldn't have doubts. Like, I know what I know. I know this is true. I know this is real. Whatever, it's not a belief. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's just a deep knowing. And whatever Muktananda says, even if he's famous, established, whatever, it doesn't matter. I know what I know. I shouldn't have doubts. And that kind of made me settled. I went to bed, I slept, slept really, you know, calm and nice. That sold all my doubts. And I thought, you know what? And I knew Muktananda is leaving the next day. And I thought like maybe I should go say bye, but I was like, you know what? I'm done. I know what I know. I don't need his recognition. I don't need, you know, him saying that I'm right. And I just took it easy. 
and I was walking around the ashram just randomly, can't remember where I was going, and <laughs> that's how life works sometimes, especially in India. Freaky stuff like that happens in India for some reason. And I meet him just like randomly on uh, the stairs. And he sees me, he smiles, and he's like, walk with me, Orcus. I'm like, okay, man. <laughs> and then we continue talking. And, uh, and uh, we're walking and we're going to his car. And he's like, you know, drive with me. And then we drive to the place where the final bus of him leaving is, is, is going to part. And I know he's leaving like in 30 minutes or something. But I see his group next to the bus gathering and we're sitting there a bit further together uh, next to some building and just the two of us, like peaceful, quiet, we're looking into nature. It was like, again, one of those beautiful moments. And uh, let me check. I know this is intriguing, but let me check the, yeah, the, the audio is still good. So we're sitting there and we started talking. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm confident, you know, I know what I know and I'm not trying to prove him wrong or anything. So we're just talking and, uh, and he's sharing a story. He started sharing a story with me and, or I think, yeah, I think for some reason what I came up to say to him is, I think I was leading the conversation to kind of make my point. And I told him one of my favorite phrases, which I introduced in one of my uh, previous one take videos. I told him, do you know that the Buddha said that doubt is the greatest sin? And it's like a great, I wasn't like trying to prove anything. I just share that phrase, which I really resonated with. And as I said, it's one of my favorite phrases I used to read. And I like that concept that the way I express it is that you can decide and you can consider maybe this is, is this better is this worse but you shouldn't be in doubt doubt is something else doubt is that undecisiveness uh consideration is good but doubtful undecisiveness is not and so that broke down to the phrase of doubt is the greatest sin for me and i told him that phrase about buddha from buddha and he's like oh i like this phrase and then he started to rep reflect about it and he told me the story of how a guy goes through a forest or a jungle and suddenly he feels for some reason he should make a step and he looks under his foot before he made a step and there's a snail and he realizes there's an intelligence, great intelligence that guides him not to hurt and it was a nice story. But then he finished saying that story and I looked at him and I said, and he's like, I, I can't remember what exactly brought that to that moment. But I looked at him and I said, you know what? I choose not to doubt. And I just said it with such decisive confidence. It was just like zero doubt in my voice. I was just like, and zero arrogance. It was just like a statement. I was like, you know what? I choose not to doubt. And he's like, I saw his eyes widen up and he liked it. You know, he's like, and that kind of ended all our uh, arguments because he knew I'm talking about, you know, early enlightenment, early understanding or capturing of enlightenment. And, and I was referring to that, I was like, I choose not to doubt. And he's like, he took a break, he took a pause and he's like, I like you, Rokas. <laughs> I looked at him, I was like, I was in that moment, I was like, I love you too, Smabi. You know, like, I love you too, man. <laughs> and I literally said, I love you. He's like, oh, he, he, I saw again, he got surprised that he liked it. And that was it. That was like, that was it. Now that I remember, it's crazy. That was like the time he had to leave and it just all went into that moment. And uh, it's been a while since I spoke, said that story. So I guess I'm getting a bit emotional. But yeah, so uh, I think we just sat there maybe in silence for a few more moments and we just, I don't even remember what happened after. Did we say bye or did we hug? Don't remember. But then he, I think I wanted to hug him but I didn't know if you can hug a monk. I'm not sure to this day, like an Indian monk, a Swami. But then he, you know, he went to his bus and that was it. And we never, it's been, I was 20, now I'm 30, so it's 10 years ago. And I never saw him again. I never looked him up. I maybe looked him up like online to see like, you know, see, I saw he wrote a book or something. So hopefully I found him and uh, you saw a picture of him. Maybe I'll leave a link to his book or whatever. But that was it, never had any more contact. Never heard about him anymore. I just knew some people who knew him, but that was it. But yeah, that was really that was a really powerful uh, moment for me because, and I'm wrapping this episode in a moment, but 
uh, because I went to India after my experience in Switzerland of living in an Aikido yoga meditation school. And I went to India for a month to travel and to kind of settle in before, because I knew the next step was coming back to Lithuania, my home country, and to open my Aikido school. And I was like only 20 years old. Well, now let me, let me think about that back. No, I was 21. 21 or 22. Anyway. So that was uh, on the moment of me coming back to it before coming back to Lithuania to establish myself in the sense that I know what I'm talking about and uh, and I can be an instructor and it was a challenging thing because I was like only in my early 20s and I was about to open a school and have adults kids too but adults coming to my teachings and to my classes and I had to be the authority figure and part of me was a bit freaking out I was like shoot you know how will I make them believe that I know my stuff being so young especially in Lithuania you know, we were still a bit more hyped about, oh, older means better. But then, so I wanted to kind of found my ground, find my ground in India to know that I, I know my stuff. And that moment just gave me so much confidence. I, I realized in that moment that I do not need another person's permission. I do not need another people's, a person's acknowledgement about the things I deeply know to be true. And that was a wonderful moment in story. And I felt like it was like almost like a, I don't like to point out at such moments too much as, you know, that's the way universe works. But it did feel like that was one of those moments where it was a gift from life. It was like meant to be. So yeah, crazy. I guess back then my life was like that. You know, full of spirituality and mystical shit and whatnot. And so I guess I took it for granted. I was like, oh, you know, this is like every, it happens to everyone. But now as I'm 30 and... I've been through all kinds of stuff and I experienced both sides of life, the, you know, the earthly realm as much as the spiritual realm. I kind of realized that actually, you know what, that's a special story. That's like, doesn't happen to everyone and doesn't happen every day. It didn't happen to me again. And yet again, I have some cool stories to share with you in the future. I hope you like this one. Let me know in the comments what you think about it. What did you take from this story? Like what? What, what did you, like, were, what, what was the moment for you like, oh, I like that idea. This is what I'm going to take away from, from this video. Let me know in the comments. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear. But yeah, more stories are going to come. Thank you for listening. And I hope it was valuable for you. And until next time, keep questioning. <laughs>